Hello and a very, very good evening to you all. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Sean and you're watching Ren11 Live. Today we are going to be looking after our dear friend Drew, who is an absolute legend. You'll probably know him from 911 Called, or as it's known now, Called Collective. And he's just come on now. A couple of things before we start. Make sure you have a beverage. I've brought myself a nice bottle of Rattler, big one as well. Going to need it and maybe a bite to eat. This will take an hour or thereabouts. Another couple of things. Remember, throughout this, please, please, please throw us some questions that you want me to ask Drew. It's very important that you guys have your voice too. So we'll make sure that you get mentioned too. Okay. Lastly, um, this is going to be going out not just here for 24 hours, but I'm also going to put it later on onto my YouTube channel. So you'll have an opportunity to watch this again and again. Without much further ado, I am going to get the man of the hour. Any moment now. Connect. Look at this dapper young fellow. Hello, sir. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, my friend. Cheers. Cheers. I don't have my <laughs> drink with me yet, but here. Uh, you didn't even have some more? Uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, I'm just drinking some credit cards, you know. Uh, making money, drinking money, it's all the same, man. How are you? Um, It's a little cold in SoCal, man. I'm not going to lie. It's um, it's probably normal for you guys over there, but over here, it's a little <laughs> cold. I'm not oh, going to lie, so... The, uh... The, the slanderous comments about our climate. <laughs> you know, no, it's UK. not slanderous if it's true. I mean, you guys, it's pretty cold over there, isn't it? From what I know. Uh, today was twenty six degrees. I don't know how much that is in 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 your in your language. I think that's yeah. probably around about seventy eight. Too much, man. Yeah, yeah and that's that's about right. I would say today is probably maybe high sixties. At least that's what it feels like. So, so cool. Amanda. Uh, so oh, what is going on? Some, uh... Got two cameras. Uh, have I got two cameras? No, no, I've got the one. I've just double clicked you... accidentally. So was that a mirror? That was a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so the, the room bathroom. I get to do this in because I don't have we don't have an office set up just yet. The room that I use is uh, my son's room when he comes to stay. So um, this is his uh, his place, but it gets to be used by me when he's not around. So there you go. Um, I did not know you had a son. I want to know what he, does he have a long beard like you? Yeah, actually, he uh, he tickled his way out uh, when he was born, bless him. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, really wanted to uh, speak to you, and and I want everyone kind of to 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 know what I know, and I kind of feel that I still haven't scratched the surface when it comes to yourself, Drew, because you are an incredibly busy individual. Um, you yeah. are working pretty much 24-7. Um, uh, maybe people know it, some people don't know and don't realise that. Um, however, um, I think it, it goes without saying there are some fruits to your labour and it's come to fruition now with everything that you've done. But we'll get to that. Let's start at the beginning. Um, your car fetish, uh, where did it start? Um... You know, it, it's funny because I, I always talk to, um, I always talk to Calvin about cars since he was young, since he was born, and I realized that Calvin's love for cars is not really deep yet. It's, I mean, his love for like robots and monsters is is way more apparent. <clears throat> and I started really thinking about like when I fell in love with the car, and I think that happened right around 1992 when I was on my way to junior high, I was carpooling. And I remember we we're at a red light and we came to a light. And I remember seeing a Ferrari. Um, but the strange thing about the Ferrari was that it had an Acura badge on it. And I couldn't figure out why a Ferrari owner would put a uh, Acura badge on their car. So, one of my good friends, his older brother is about 10 years older than us, and he's really heavy into cars. <clears throat> and what ended up happening was I asked him, I was like, yo, I saw a Ferrari with an Acura badge on it. Uh, what gives? You know, and he goes, 
he goes, no, no, it's, it's, he goes, you, you must have seen something else or whatnot. And of course, later on, we realized it was the NSX. And the NSX came out right around that time. And for some reason, around my area, somebody had purchased a, a Formula Red NSX. And so that was kind of the first memory that I have of being in love with the car kind of on my own. My uncle did have a Pontiac Fiero that I remember him taking me to like uh, the doctors in and stuff. And I remember that car was pretty cool, but I think it was really at the start of um, the NSX. And then at the time where um, the early nineties where guys were fixing up like Honda civics and stuff, EFs and stuff, I remember seeing them slammed. I think that was really the start of it, but you know, in Southern California, we were exposed to the grassroots of, of the Honda scene. And to me, being 12, 13 years old, it was the guys that were doing it who were 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. You know, they really had started this movement. You know, a lot of it probably started in Japan and stuff. But to me, that's where I think that's where it really sparked off. So um, I never really got into European cars till much later in life, meaning the, probably last five years ago. Um, I never really had a desire to really be in the Euro scene just because I was still really enamored with the Japanese scene. Mm -hmm. But the only problem with the Japanese scene is that it's the cars are very limited. You know, the historic component of Japanese cars, it does go back to the 60s, but not in a really, you know, in a vast sense. We know that like Nissan obviously had a bigger play. Honda had some play. Toyota had some play, but they didn't really have a lot of cars that were really iconic per se. So um, I think it wasn't until later where I kind of, I guess, piqued my interest in the JDM scene is when I start to really head to the European scene, but also when my wife really wanted me to explore cars with back seats is I think that's when I ended up in the Euro scene. So <laughs> you can't get rear seats in an NSX, sadly. Um, so uh, you know, I can remove the engine and put it into the <laughs> trunk and then I might be able to put some back seats in there. So what's up, RJ? <laughs> Yeah, that uh, is that that is RJ Devera, as in like um, uh, that's RJ like Devera. that's like RJ RJ like famous RJ Fast and Furious RJ RJ like so, I mean RJ he goes back to like the early long days of you know of all that GDM stuff so um, yeah and you know Eric coming in here like you know the the funny thing is NSX is such a pinnacle and apex car for 90s Japanese technology you know and I think for a lot of us growing up it was such a it was a car that was really untouchable because mm. it was very expensive um, you know they weren't really around and um, nobody was really modding them because we know that I always say true enthusiasts don't come around to third or fourth owners and we know that uh, usually first owners are usually people with a lot of money but no style and no heart and what ends up happening is they usually lease them or have them for business purposes or they have it driving around and show it off a bit and then until it gets handed down you know then you come across people who've just always wanted it but couldn't afford it or whatever the case is and so um and i think the nsx in its 15 year span had that run and a lot of us were really lucky enough to get them you know at a really good price point but even today i still think at the prices they're at now um, I still think they're straight a uh, great value for what you can get. So, well, yeah, if you consider the reliability um, as well as attached to it, the fact that it can drive very sedately if you wanted to, and the fact that it can be driven incredibly hard, um, it is a, a car for, for for all purposes, really. Um, so, what if it's only got two seats? Um, but, but I agree with you. Uh, and there's that, that there's that added element. And obviously, this is a Porsche page. But if you know me, I'm I'm a massive Honda nut as well. Um, there's that added touch that Senna had a hand in developing the chassis. And for that, it's, 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 there's a real love for that car. You know. Yeah, I think I think at the time, what what Honda was doing in the early '90s was, I mean, they were really pushing the envelope. They really were getting a lot of hands on deck. Um, and, you know, when the, the replacement came out, you know, that's what I'll call it. But it's I, I just felt like a lot of things were shortcutted and I felt like it, it's a great car. However, because of the way they historically touched an iconic car, I felt like it really fell flat. 
and nobody really cared for it. But I mean, people do, the people who do love it, love it. But I don't think it's, it's going to ever have the real historic value that the original NSX has ever had. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I just feel like there's just too many components of that car just kind of coming short, even though it's such a great car. But, you know, once again, it, we know that performance is only a small bit. I think we find, we're finding out more and more that having a car that's precision and fast and, and amazing is only a small bit of a factor of why somebody wants to own and drive a car. Hmm. Um, and so for me, it's, you know, and I think that's the reason why we keep falling back to more and more analog cars because, you know, nowadays every car is a computer and I don't want to drive a computer. I want to drive a car. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's funny though, isn't it? Cause it's, in, it's, I suppose, second iteration sans for the, the, the facelift that it had um, and continued selling for quite many, quite a few more years. But, why is it that the NSX, dare I say it, has faltered a little bit, whereas, let's say, the 911 has improved pretty much with every iteration from the previous Well, one? the, 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 pro the problem with the, the Japanese market is that the Japanese are so conservative and they're super tight with their, their, their money, right, their R&D. And so what happens is, especially like Honda, they built a car and they kind of, even with the S2000, they kind of feel like we spent all this money up, up in the front and we, and you know, along the way, they didn't really touch the car that much, you know, in 94, they, you know, 91 to 94, they built all the coupes and then 95 on up, it was basically our Targas. Mm -hmm. And um, in 97, they came out the three, two and the, and the six speed. But other than that, uh, after that O2, they came out the facelift, but you know they didn't really touch the power plant too much. And I think if they released a V8, four liter, four hundred horsepower, NA3, I think it would have really re-sparked the love for the car. But unfortunately, with with Honda, they even with the S2000, they saw just moderate gains. And what happens is, you know, they they make a car and they were running for ten or fifteen years, and meanwhile, the competition, Nissan, Toyota, whatever, is coming out with more power more torque or whatever the case is and you know people start gravitating stuff that's newer and so mm. um towards the end of the life honda didn't really sell that much and um you know eventually just let it go and so um i just think that they need to fight a little bit harder to kind of keep up with the joneses but yeah. you know even when in 08 when the economy i remember because originally the, the nsx replacement was supposed to be a v10 and what ended up happening was when the economy was taking a dump they just scrapped everything and it was like, dude, they were supposed to have come out with a, a small displacement V10. And that would have been amazing. They would have sold tons of those. Mm -hmm. And the original design they had was really just amazing. But unfortunately, you know, th their budget got, you know, the best of them. And, and what happens is Honda, like a lot of Japanese companies, they'll make a great car. They'll stop making it for like five, 10 years. And then basically they'll bring it back. Whereas mm -hmm. the 911, you know, they've built it since 1964. And they just keep progressing with it. And so... You know the 911 is legendary for that for that way. Same same with the Corvette, maybe even the Mustang. Dare I say? But you know these cars have just been around for such a long time. You have a huge fan base of people who who um, you know who love them. And so if the NSX, I think if they continue to build it, uh, if they built it more gradually without just jumping from stopping in 05, jumping straight to you know this hybrid car that they have, it would have been it would have been more the transition would have been easier, but unfortunately that didn't happen. So mm -hmm. it's a shame. Um, but kind of leads us back into 911 territory again, which uh, sure. you know, this is a 911 page and you're kind of famous for having how many, okay. I've, I've got a list of 911s that you've had. <laughs> so your first one was a guards red C4 964 uh, called wildfire. Am I right? Wildfire. Yep. Yep. Calvin uh, named then... that uh, at a young age. Cool. He, he has good taste. Uh, then you had the white 997 GT3 called Baymax. So um, what ended up happening was I bought um, Wildfire in May of 2015. Yeah. And on December 15th, almost six months, um, about six months later, um, on December 15th, I bought an, an, another guard, Guards Red 91 C2 that most people don't know about. So uh -huh. I originally found that on Craigslist. And because it was a C2 with low miles, I went out and bought the car. And to tell you the truth, I went out and bought the car. Um, and I am so sorry. No, you're right. 
I did buy the GT3 first. On, De on December 15th, I bought the GT3. And then eight days later, I found a C2 on Craigslist. Yep. And mind you, when I bought that C2, I had no money for it. But because I didn't want to let this one sit through my fingers, I begged a couple of buddies of mine <laughs> and said, I need a large sum of money, no questions asked. <laughs> and I got it. And so <laughs> what ended up happening was um, I bought the C2. It was completely stock. And the reason why I bought it was because my C4 that I got was kind of in more of driver condition. And I like my cars to be really clean and pristine. And so what ended up happening was I went out and um, I went to go test drive this car. I went to the guy I bought my GT3 from owns a shop called Mr. Silver Lake back at the time. And he said, Drew, I want to bring a car over here, meet the guy here, and we'll do a PPI for you for free. Um, I went to go test drive the car and I did absolutely did not like the car. So what ended up happening was I told um, Tom, I was like, yo, you know what? You know, you, know, you guys don't even have to uh, PPI the car. I'm not going to buy it. I don't, I don't like the way this car drives. I don't like the way it feels. Um, and he was like, well, let's just do the PPI anyways. So they did the PPI and he, you know, the, his mechanic came back and said, man, this is one of the cleanest 964s I've ever inspected. And I was like, damn, damn it. And at the time, it was about, I don't know, in the 40s or so. And so um, I was like, you know what? Forget it. I'll buy it. So I said, give me two days. I rounded up some money and I bought the car. Um, and so, so kind of going back, yeah, so I bought the GT3 first. So what ended up happening was when I bought the car in May, I was actually in March, I was, I was negotiating between 964 and the GT3. And the 997 GT3 was probably the only other car that I remember falling in love so deeply with. Um, but I just figured I would never have one. And I remember when in 07, when the GT3 came out, I just remember going, damn, like 911s. I remember having a 996 turbo, like on my wall in college, but it wasn't until the 997 GT3, the point one came out. I remember it just mesmerizing me like the NSX did. Um, and at the time I just figured, you know, GT3 were super expensive, which I'm sure they were at the time. Um, but I just figured it, was a, it wasn't a car I would ever pursue. Um, eventually, when the time came, I knew that it was, it was a car I really wanted, but it was higher than I wanted to spend. And so I was kind of pursuing a 964, but there was a time where I was pursuing an Ohio GT3 and this 964 from North Carolina. And we're going back and forth for th three weeks just between the two owners. And I said, look, whoever gives it first, that's a car I'm going to buy. And the 964 ended up closing. And what ended up happening was in December, a buddy of mine, um, I was looking for a GT3. I found one in San Francisco, a white one, an 07. And my buddy said, hey, man, I know you're looking for one. There's, a, there's one in LA. And I was like, dude, no way, man, because I know every single GT3 that's for sale. And there's usually not that many at, at, at any given time. And um, no, he goes, no, there is one. It's unlisted. You should go check it out. So he gave me the number and I called and Tom answered and we ended up talking. Tom was super cool, um, super friendly, super patient. And I went to go check out the car and it was kind of higher mileage. It had 30, 37,000 miles. And for a GT3, that's kind of considered high miles. And um, I went to go um, test drive it. And wow, fucking Dude, I fell in love so hard with it. Just unbelievable. Just the experience. To me, it, the only way I can describe it is I felt like if Honda came out with an NA3 with that V8, with a four liter V8, um, that was a little bit more raw in nature. That's what, to me, it kind of felt like. Not as neutral as the NSX is in the handling on the side, but for the most part, I felt like it felt like a modern day NSX. That was all analog. And I just, it was insane. So I ended up, I don't even know. I mean, I sold my S6000 at the time. I had an S6000. I was original owner for 10 years. A car I was never going to sell. I got 30000 for that. Um, and I started scrounging money. I started selling off a bunch of stuff and eventually ended up with a GT3. And that's why when the, uh, I found the C2 a week later, I had no money. You know, I was just like, I, I mean, I can't afford it, but I couldn't let it go. So I had to pull a lot of favors to get that car. Hmm. Um, and so um, I kept those three cars for about 15 months. And then about the following January, um, I ended up, well, about 13 or 14 months later, about that January, February, I ended up listing it. And it took me that one, that car took about, 
it took about three months to sell because I bought it in the forties or so, and I was listing for mid fifties. And um, this guy in Palos Verdes came and bought it. His wife had like a twin turbo Dodge Viper. She's a super crazy chick, and um, they bought the car. And um, you know, I only put on three hundred miles with that car because, um, like I said, man, I never enjoyed driving that car for some reason. It just felt really soft and slow, and um, and just just components of that car to me that that really didn't speak to me. And normally, like people hear me speaking very highly of nine six fours, and it was a standard, you know, they standard not, car. Well, the standard C two, mm-hmm. and something about the that driving experience on the car wasn't enjoyable. But in in hindsight, what I realized was because the eighty nine C four that I got was heavily modified, um, I realized I come to you know I just really got used to driving a modified lowered you know, seat, steering wheel, like exhaust. And this, that component of the C4 really kind of captured my heart. So um, what ended up happening was I was really, I wasn't really interested in the C2. And another reason why, I mean, the reason why I bought the C2 originally was I was going to take all the C4 parts and I was going to dump them into the C2 and then sell the C4. But what ended up happening with that was the C2 was so absolutely cherry that I kind of felt guilty about taking the car apart. And so I never really touched it. I never really drove it. And that's the reason why most people don't know about it. But I do have a lot of pictures of their cars together, which I posted in the past. Yes. But um, that car was completely stock. Um, and, um, and then it wasn't until the following year when I picked up the two white C4s and C2 um, 964. So. That was it. Yeah, yeah. The white nine, C2 964. You also had a, a Glacier white uh, C2 S993. Yeah, so actually, what what did I buy first? I actually ended up buying. Was the, it the actually ended up buying, I ended up buying the the nine nine three. The the I actually ended up buying the nine nine three first. So a year mm-hmm. after I sold, um, actually sold the C two, and I think that same weekend or the weekend after, for whatever reason, like I wasn't ever really like really sprung on 993s but i was curious about them and i always felt like maybe they're just a more modern feel modern touch of a 964 so i was one day i just saw a picture and i was just kind of inspired to get one i found one in new york uh, a wide body one and we're negotiating for a while and then all of a sudden on craigslist i don't know i mean like craigslist like ended up coming in heavy i found a white one with the with the arrow kit and it was a c2s and immediately I emailed and said, hey, I'm very interested in this car. Um, um, uh, you know, I love 911s. I love air-cooled cars. Would you please talk to me? And would you remove the listing? So my big thing is whenever I buy a car, I always, if I, especially if I get in early, I always ask them to remove the listing because I don't want to compete with the public, right? Because you want to try to cut off a lot of tire kickers and a lot of people confusing the seller. So... Uh, so what ended up happening was I went out and um, drove up to San Francisco or to uh, Redwood City. And sure enough, I, you know, I took some cash and the rest I had to pull out of the bank. I went up there with a couple buddies and my wife and stuff. And uh, actually, you know, my wife didn't go. Uh, we, get to the, we get to the house, very nice house. Uh, so it was, it was woman, it was, it was woman driven. Uh, it was a lady driven car. <clears throat> She's owned it for like 10 years. And uh, I remember when they, so her and her husband, they have no kids and they basically race cars. They had like a bunch of uh, 911 race cars and stuff. And I remember when they pulled it out of the garage, I was mesmerized about the build quality of the 993 because that, that arrow kit, man, you could just tell where a lot of the aesthetical like upgrades on the car existed. And I remember going, damn, like this car is really clean. And then I went for the test drive, and that's kind of where I fell out of love with the 993. Um, the car, it just was really soft. It was lazy in nature. Um, and there's, I mean, it kind of had some balls to it. But other than that, like, to me, there are components of that driving characteristics that I didn't really like that much. But here's the thing. Because the car was priced decently, and I made the entire trip up there. I mean, I've driven, I've, most of my cars I get from NorCal. And even when I bought my like M3, uh, I went up and bought the car. And I, once again, I didn't fall in love with the car right away. And I normally would have passed on it. But because it was a pretty decent price, 
I ended up buying these cars. So the 993, I drove the car, told my buddy Randy, who went with me, I was like, you know what? I'm not really feeling this car. It's a great looking car. It, you know, it, it looks amazing, but I just, I'm not in love with it. But I negotiated price a little bit and she was willing to come down a bit. So I bought the car. Mm. And of course, you know, when I got back down, my wife, you know, she was kind of liking it, but she really fell in love with it at a later time. Mm. But you know, for me, like, it, it was a car that I just struggled with for a lot. And, and I was like, you know, maybe I can grow into it. You know, I had it for two and a half years. And, you know, it just, after I did a lot I did a modifications to it, I felt like I was digging it more. But after I sold my, my other 964s, and I went only when I only had the 993, then I kind of felt like, all right, it's a, it's a cool car because I, I wasn't doing direct comparing it to a GT3 or a 964, which I like driving better than a 993. And so, um, and so the problem is, is it's so funny because like when I only had an S two thousand, when you only have one car, you know everything about that car. You know how to drive it. You know heel toe rev match, and you know the characteristics of that car. Correct. Yeah. But once you start having three, four, five, there was a time I had like twelve cars, and um, when you have that many, you cars, have an understanding wife, man. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, you know, we've been together since high school, so she knows all of my, you know, my habits and stuff. But, you know, <laughs> the, the, the thing is when you, <laughs> my, my, my bad habits, you know. So the thing is um, <laughs> when you have that many cars, you can't really drive any of the cars correctly. Yeah. Because what ends up happening is your muscle memory for each car, it just, I mean, th just think about it. For a guys like us to go out and drive a car, it still takes effort, right? I mean, either this weekend or next week, you don't drive it every day. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is if you have, like there was a time I had like maybe of the 12 cars, I think about seven of them were toy cars. You can't drive seven cars enough to build muscle memory in those cars unless you've driven it exclusively for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I had the NSX, I only had that in S2000 and they're kind of similar in makeup. But once I went European, man, like I just, I lost it, man. I couldn't really drive anything properly. And so uh, there was a period of time I started selling cars off because I realized like it was, and it was just one of those things when you get into the mentality of just collecting or buying stuff, like it doesn't end. You just keep, you just keep buying for the sake of buying stuff. And so I've gotten to the point where I try to change my lifestyle a bit and, and, and try to live a little bit less and, and more of a minimalistic lifestyle and say, hey, look, you don't need to have X amount of cars because, and it was never a thing of like, for I wouldn't ever call myself a collector. It was just because I would say, uh, since a lot of us are car fanatics, yes. we just like, it's just like, a, if you like to cook, you like to have a spice rack, right? You need the black pepper, you need the cayenne, you know, the garlic powder, you need all the variety. And so I was just collecting cars. I, once again, I don't want to use the term collecting. I was buying cars because I just like driving them and I just wanted to have a better understanding of them. But it wasn't until I realized like I was becoming a worse driver that I really started to just kind of let them go and start to kind of hone in on my, on my, my collection, I guess, or my, my circle of cars. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, of course, when I sold the, uh, 964, I still had wildfire, but I ended up letting wildfire go too, because a customer of mine at my shop directly, reversed into the car and jacked up the door and stuff but at that time i was already kind of already wanting to get into a different 964 just because i can't really put my finger on it right now but it had something to do with um wanting um a white one i think i think that's probably what it was um to match the nsx and the the nsx and the didn't, but on all my cars actually all my cars were um were white and so, yeah. except for I had a few red cars. I had my S2000, which was red, but I sold that to get the GT3. And then I had Wildfire, and I had Calvin named the other one, the, uh, the Stock C2 um, Igniter. So, um, anyways, those two were finally gone. And I remember what ended up happening was I found um, a white C4 um, somewhere online. I think it was – so it, that, that car was owned by Mark who used to work at 1552 and um ah, okay yeah yeah so mark i remember seeing his car somewhere and i was just going good lord this car is extremely clean and i bugged mark for some time and said hey yo mark will you sell it to me so he was kind of on the fence of selling it and he had a price point he wanted 
and I think it was like mid fifties and it was worth what he wanted. I mean, he had some nice parts on it and, you know, we're going back and forth for a few months and we ended up kind of like, you know, losing touch on, you know, that whole communication. And I remember at the Peterson, there was an event and I was walking around and I saw a white 964 and I was like, good Lord, whose car is this? Right. So I was, I was, I was hanging around for 20 minutes or so. And I was like, man, this car really looks familiar. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And I realized it was Mark's car. So I sent him a DM. I was like, yo, meet me at your car. Show me your car right now. So he showed me his car. And a month after that, we ended up closing the deal because I wanted it at a lower price. I wanted it at 50 and Mark wasn't willing to budge. And I went to go look at a couple other white 964s that were just terrible. And um, so I went back to Mark. I did another test drive of, this, of his car. And instantly, I just fell in love with the car. You know, and his, his car had Recar A8s. It had KWV 3s yeah. it, had, it had some nice parts on it, you know. And um, so I ended up pulling the trigger on it, which... I loved, you know, that was a car I was going to have for a long time. And, and this, it just kind of goes back to the people who call, you know, they're calling me a car flipper and all that stuff. The only reason why um, I sold that car was because when I was talking to Mark around February or March, it was around March, actually. Um, I was talking to a guy in Minnesota about the C2. He actually mm-hmm. hit me up on, on, on Renlist and said, hey, Drew, I have a white 92 c2 and um um and he i remember he had priced it at mid 50s for c2 and i was like man it's white and a c2 and a 92 i'm interested but he was like man we have four feet of snow here um hit me up in the spring i was like what like dude i'm ready to buy you know because you know and so um i was like all right so you know and i i was emailing him once a month he goes no no there's too much snow here it's, it's not the right time. And <clears throat> what ended up happening was I kind of, we, we lost touch. And then I saw Mark's car. And then I was like, yo, I'm going to, um, I'm going to buy Mark's car. And so I bought Mark's car and fell in love with it. And then sometime in May, no, in July. So basically I hit him up again in April. He said, no, it's too much snow still. Um, then I was like, you know what? This guy's never going to sell the car to me. You know, it just seemed like he was kind of pulling my leg. Mm-hmm. In June, he actually emailed me, or June or July emailed me and said, hey, I'm ready to sell now. And I was like, what? Like, no way. And he was like, no, man, I'm ready, ready to sell. And so at the time, <laughs> when it was happening, Tim, so my buddy Tim, who owns uh, Leslie now, he, Leslie is a C4. Uh, I named the C4 after the tow truck driver who came to save me on the freeway. He was an amazing guy. So oh. I named the car after him. Yeah. You took some photos of that back in the day. Um... Exactly. Yeah, the tire, was it a tire problem or? Yeah, a tire blew out. Yeah, that so, was it. Uh, um, so I named the car after him. And, um, and sure enough, um, I get this email from, you know, the guy and said, hey, I'm ready to sell. And so at the time I was talking to Tim, Tim was kind of curious about 911s. And I said, hey, man, you, you should, if you, I mean, he had sold, he sold his S2000 a few years ago to one of my other buddies. And I was like, hey, man, if you want to buy a car and maybe sell on some money, you should get into a 964. And I was like, you know, it's expensive, but, you know, and Tim is like in his mid 20s. So Tim is probably one of the younger 964 owners because, uh, you know, most of them are a little bit older now. They're about uh, all right. And I was like, hey, yeah. And I was like, you know what? If you can make it happen, I would say it would be a good piece for you to kind of break into the Porsche world and maybe network and stuff. And, and so, but I told him, I was like, don't feel pressured because I'm not, I, if anything, I'll just keep the C4 and I'll buy the C2. And he ended up, I asked him, I was like, hey, do you want to go to Minnesota with me? You know, just out of the blue. And he was like, yeah, I'm down to go. So because he, you know, he, he's known, like, every time I go up to Nor- NorCal to buy a car, like my NSX, all my white cars and stuff, he's like, oh, man, it'll, it'll be really cool to be a part of that adventure. And I was like, dude, Minnesota, are you in or not? And he goes, dude, I'm in. So we flew to Minnesota. And, of course, that's where we met Chris uh, Clewell, which, you know, that was random how that happened. But, you know, Chris is amazing. You know, he spent – the entire day with us. And um, I ended up buying a car from this other Chris. So there was two Chris's that both started with a K. Um, I ended up buying this car. And sure enough, when I got into, remember when I told you I got into the 91 C2 and I didn't really, I didn't have any vibes with this car. When I got into the 92 C2, um, as soon as I got into, I drove a couple miles. I told Tim, Oh my God, 
this car drives amazingly. I need to buy it. So <laughs> I bought the car and Tim said, hey, look, um, actually a day before we left, Tim said, you know what? I'll buy your car, dude. I, 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 he ended up managing up, uh, managing to scrounge up some money to be able to do so, pull some favors. And I told him, man, whenever you buy any type of older car, you have to be creative because not banks are not going to go, oh, yeah, I would totally give you money for a 20, 30-year-old car. They'll never do that. They'll only give you like a fraction of the money. Mm-hmm. So he had to pull a lot of favors. And I said, you know, and we, we called Tim MBN because um, he got into a 964 so easily because anytime you're looking for an older car, you have to look for months and you got to go look. And, you know, then you go to see the car and you find out the car is shitty and all this stuff. Meanwhile, Chris is... He came to see the car. I mean, or Tim, I mean, he already knows about the car. So he already knew it was like, he knows that if I bought it, it was already going to be good because I'm not going to go out and try to buy a piece of shit car. And so he already knew that he was in good hands. So he told me the day before that he wanted to buy it. And I was kind of getting him to second guess himself because I, I mean, I just, I was going to just hold on to both, but um, he was like, no, no, I'll take it. So, um, so ended up buying a C2 a week later, it arrived and man, I fell in love with it. But, um, and I've said this many times before, but the reason why I ended up selling that two months later was, uh, my parents had just retired and they had some debt that they, they had lingering and it was a tough time because I was helping them pay for it. But the interest rates were freaking super high at the time. They had a, a second on their house that ended up, you know, costing, it was, I was paying almost like $700 a month on it. And I decided instead of paying $700 a month on it, I decided that I was going to sacrifice the car and just get into a car later. So I ended up selling the C2, which, which hurt because, you know, that was, I really loved that car. Oh, you loved it. Yeah. Uh, oh, dude, I absolutely love that car. It was so perfect. And, um, but I ended up getting top dollar for that car and that really helped allow to pay off a majority of their debt, but it still wasn't enough. And that's the reason why I also ended up selling the GT3. So, um, those two cars, which, because, you know, all my cars are paid off. So it wasn't a thing of finance. It was just a thing of like, do I just keep the cars around and pay just tremendous amount of interest every month? Or do I just, you know, just get rid of them? And then they just kind of go and went back to that whole idea of just maybe shrinking it down and, and keeping cars that, that I, I could just truly enjoy without going overboard. But the GT3 was really tough for me to give up because that, car was just an extraordinary car i suppose it's a bit newer than the 964s and whatnot so perhaps they will come up again for an opportunity when an opportunity arises you know um but at the end of the day it was good what you did you know for your benefit but it was also for your your family as well yeah you know and it, 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 it was an easy decision because you know cars will come and go and mm. um you know, if in hindsight, what I should have done was I should have just sold the 993 off the bat. But my wife liked it because it was one of one of the few cars I owned that still had back seats and was comfortable enough. Like it had had tint, which I normally don't have tint on my cars, but had tint. It had AC. It had an MP3 player, and my wife liked it. You know, and because of that, I kept the car around. Uh, and obviously, GT3. I mean, the whole reason why I even got to 911 was because she was telling me we needed back seats, so it wouldn't have made sense for me to keep the GT3. Because it had no back seats. No, no back you know? seats, exactly. And although, if most people know, the 997.1 GT3 is the only GT3 that you can actually add rear seats and a seatbelt in the back. Okay. Um, was that I was gonna, or dealer option? So basically what happened, no, there, there was no option, but they left all the bolting holes. But what ended up happening was for the point two, they, they got rid of them because they knew that people were going to try to do that. And so, um, so and that's another reason why I love the point ones is because it still has that option for a, for a family guy like me. Like I just wanted to put in one seat, not two seats, just because it was just, I only have one son. So I was, I just wanted to put that one seat in just for Calvin. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately if I, in hindsight, I would have, man, it's so tough. Cause if I, had, if I had to be, be pressed for it, for sure, I would have sold the 993. I had, I had to, I had to sell two of those, of the three cars. And if it came down to between a GT3 and a 964 C2, I think I would have sold a C2 because I only got more money than I had paid for the car. And so financially, it made sense for me to get rid of it. Whereas the GT3, I made a little bit of money on it after owning it. But it just, man, there's so many things I would have done in hindsight. When I bought the GT3, the GT3 I, I should have bought 
three nine six fours instead, um, because at the at the time it the three nine six fours was equivalent to one GT three, at the time I bought it, Jesus. and if I had done that, I could have freaking I could have done that, and then I could have sold off in like two or three years later I could have sold off two of them, and I could have had a free GT three and I kept a nine six four. Oh my god, <laughs> that, that was the worst feeling ever. <laughs> we need to change the subject before you start pulling what little hair you've got left out, man. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but but the thing is, you know, you've got yourself back into 964 ownership with the oak green metallic. You know, you've still got, um, <coughs> it's an NA2, isn't it? The NSX that you own. Um, it's an O2. Yeah, it's an O2. So a lot of people forget yeah. that um, um, a lot of people call the flip, uh, the, the fixed headlights uh, NA2s. But the NA2s actually started in 97. So the flip lights have NA2s from 97 to 01. And then from 02 to uh, 05, it's still considered an NA2, but right. the way it's described as NA2 O2 plus O2. is what it's described as. Yeah. So it's got the fixed headlights rather than that. Okay. Yeah. So you've got that in, yeah. in white. Is it championship H as well? No, it's uh, so championship white only came in type R configurations. The R's, yeah. And exactly. this one is a uh, Grand Prix white. Grand Prix white. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So you've got that. You've got the C2. You've got the. Uh, W124 uh, estate. Yeah. You've yeah. got the CRV. You've got yeah. <laughs> you, you, I mean, you one life. Man. You got a few, man. Um, but that's it's an incredible collection. And it's a great story and lineage of, of how you, you change throughout. But it kind of brings us into Cool Collective a little bit, or as originally known when I when I first uh, found out about you through uh, the lads in PCAR talk was uh, 911 Cool. Um, what was the impetus? You, you started that in September 2017, am I right? Yeah. There, yeah. Uh, what, what, what made you want to move forward with 911 Cooled and let it cool collected? You know what? I actually, <clears throat> funny thing is, I started the account back in 2015 when I bought my 964. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew at some point I would do something with the page along the line somewhere, sometime. So I started a page and I put up a few pictures, but I didn't really spend too much time until 20, 2017. Um, eventually, you know, I was, I was, uh, I, I have a shop and, um, you know, my shop just celebrated its 10 year anniversary and, uh, Congratulations. Along, thank you. Thank you. Um, along the lines, um, my wife, my wife loves to travel and, you know, I was at the shop all the time. I was building the shop and, my wife always wanted to travel. So I was like, you know what? I want to start something where I can maybe be a little bit more focused on, on traveling. And <clears throat> if anything, um, just being a part of a, just a new adventure. So in 2017, I ended up uh, starting, actually what ended up happening was I ended up starting three YouTube channels, um, a family Hope travel, yeah. yeah, family travel cars and, and food. food. Um, yeah. And, I said, whichever one takes off with more traction, that's where I'll spend most of my time. And actually, no, it wasn't food. It was actually Calvin's channel. Like I started a channel with Calvin, um, but Calvin was super young. Calvin was at the time, um, he was about seven years old and he still had a hard time <clears throat> keeping up with the lines and stuff. And I was getting frustrated. He was getting kind of frustrated and I didn't like that, that energy too much. So I was like, maybe we'll do this again in a couple of years. And I was trying to, you know, I was trying to juggle three channels and it was chaos. Um, and I realized 911 stuff was kind of starting to pick up some steam. And that's where I started to kind of focus my energy. Um, and in, in, um, 2017, when I started all of this, I decided to take a leave of absence from my shop and, um, had my manager basically take over. And I spent most of my time just building 911 cooled. And, um, it was just a way for me to take all of my skill sets and my talents and just try to share that with the, uh, with the world, you know, with the online world. Mm. Um, and I did that originally just to started to curate photos because, you know, I've been a photographer since 2002 and I just yes. felt like I wanted a page where I can have, you know, some of the, the better quality photos all on one page. Um, and then it wasn't really a way, like I could have showcased my own work. But I didn't do that because even though I've been a photographer for such a long time, but I spent the last previous five years not really shooting too much because, you know, I became more of a businessman and I spent most of my time just operating businesses. Um, and so it was just a way for me to still use my knowledge and expertise and, and build a curated page. Um, but it wasn't until I ran into some issues in 
June or May, May of 2018. I'm sorry, 2019. 19 was is, last year, wasn't yeah. it? I remember the discussions we had. So, yeah. So basically, I kind of, you know, had to make some changes. And at that time, you know, I thought it wasn't going to be a big deal. I just changed the name and just kind of keep doing what I was doing. But somewhere along the lines, I, I realized I should just probably pick up and, and, and just put my, my work out there because I didn't know how else to differentiate myself with the onslaught of um, pages that were coming out and doing it. And so I just <laughs> Sorry. figured, um, <laughs> I don't know. But you know what the thing is? Like, I don't, have a, I don't really have a problem with people who do that. I just, for me, the biggest thing is like, I like to see people who are engaging the community. That, like, I want to see people who, like, I remember you in the conversations I've had with you before, like you even started all of it or made your complete name change. But, you know, there's some pages out there. All they do is, um, they just regurgitate everything out there to a high level with no, no curation. It's just, it's just almost, I mean, quote unquote, I, I just call it vomiting because it's just like whatever they can get is to just throwing out as much as possible. And to me, it's like that, that to me, the idea of saturation is such a unappealing thing for me. It's like, I want to see somebody who takes the effort to, to, you know, that they put some work in. And so to me, when I decided to do that, like I love people who, I don't mind people who do that, but like show love to the community, meaning that like, don't just go out and just regurgitate a bunch of stuff and nobody knows your name. Nobody knows your face. Um, you have nothing to do with, you know, being a part of a community. And that's just my biggest thing is that I want people to know that when they follow me, that there's somebody who's going to answer your DMs. You know, when we send out merch, it's being sent out by my wife or me. Um, that I'm designing it or I have an in-house designer that I hired or whatever the case is. And there's a lot of stuff that's going on behind the scenes that comes from my heart, you know, that I put a lot of love into. And so for me, it's the, the big thing is like, yo, it's when I realized I had to change, I realized that I had to put out something different, which was something that I didn't want to do, which was, you know, be a full-time photographer again, because I've, I've been doing it for so long that it wasn't something that, it, that, uh, that interested in me. Mm -hmm. But I knew that in order for me to grow the brand, that that was something that I had to do. And so basically, all the way from June on out is all my own stuff. So you see, it's cool. Yeah. And, and you can see the difference, you know, and you definitely have a tone. You have a, I, I think I said this um, uh, maybe in passing, but there's a particular language that you can see from a good photographer. They have their own interpretation of how things look and it's everything from you know, the, the, the quality of the photo and how it's been either edited or how it's been taken. There is a, a strong voice from that artist uh, and all of your images are clearly you, if that makes sense. You've got your own language on there. It's beautiful um, and, and really well done on the page because since you've done that and I remember the, the struggle there was getting to 50K but we're knocking on the door of 60K now. You know, it's yeah. not long until that hits. And, and it's, uh, it's completely from, you know, your hard work. And I suppose it kind of leads on to another question. I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the photography, but I, before I do that, I want to kind of log into how busy you truly are. Because as, as people know, you are Cool Collective. You are the face, the voice of Cool Collective. You do an awful lot um, in front of the camera, and behind uh, the camera as well. But then you've got a podcast called Life on Height, which may I just say, if you need, if you want a podcast that looks into the why of why people do it and the how people do it, that's the podcast you want to listen to, Life on Height. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to having more, listen to, to more of it as well, man. Um, and then you've got Andrew Manlycom. You've got Manly Car Journal, you've got Drew Curated, you've got Manly Eats, you've got Manly Automotive, you've got your photography business. The business that uh, Drew was talking about, ladies and gents, was his photography uh, business that he actually sells products, uh, kit and, and all that as well. It's not just, uh, it, it's not a car shop. Um, you know, you've got your YouTube channels, you've got your main YouTube channel, which is obviously Cool Collective. You've got 7.65 thousand uh, uh, subs. You've got over, uh, well, 120 videos. You've now got Mike, who is helping you out, and uh, he's an absolute legend. I love that guy. Um, That's awesome. You know, what is making you push 
all these different things. I mean, you, you obviously the focus is called collective. We know this, but you still have a hand in doing a little bit here and a little bit there. Maybe a few months go away without doing anything, but then you put content on there and you still carry on and push forward. The more you do, the more you push forward. What drives you to do that? You know, I think a lot of it just comes down to, um, I mean, probably because I'm Korean, I'm, I'm a workaholic. Um, I, <laughs> okay. I think I think a lot of it really comes down to um, there are certain things that I want to accomplish. I mean, I turned forty in February, and I want to I wanted to I wanted my forties to be filled with with just a new air, like a new air, you know. And I feel like all my twenties and all of my thirties and all of my forties, I feel like every ten years I kind of have to start something new, something fresh. Um, you know, when I in my photography, I had a really awesome photography career a lot of people don't know about it because i don't really talk about a lot of my my old my my history because like even when i came into the, the portrait world like i didn't want to come in saying hey here are my accolades and this is why you should know me and want to hang out with me like to me it was like hey here i am i'm a guy who likes cars if you like cars and you're cool we should hang and i didn't want to come in saying hey look um this is what i've accomplished and this is why like people know me. And so when I decided to come into the car world, I kind of came in just really low key and just say, Hey, look, um, I, I own a car. Let's, you want, let's go for a drive. I like to drive. Let's drive. I like to eat. Let's eat, you know? And it, I didn't want, even when like, cause when I came into the scene, like I, I have a lot of buddies that have a lot of contacts. I know a lot of people in the car game, but I didn't want to come in saying, Hey, yo, can you connect me with this guy or that guy? And um and help me build clout because ultimately at the end, it's not about me knowing and hanging out with the elite, right? Like the Porsche elitist or anybody who's an elite. Because at the end of the day, it's it's like if, if I meet you and you've already you've already made it, you're already that guy who's built his uh, empire and you already have everything you want. I feel like at that point, life is a little dull and boring, right? If you're not challenging yourself to build something new and, and to go for the next gusto, I feel like, you know, like I'm not really trying to hang out with people who are trying to stale out. And so if I meet a guy who's young and he's, you know, like I, I love meeting young guys that have a lot of ambition. You know, Estevan, you know, SC, shot by SD is one of those guys from Miami. I love, I love yeah. him. Me and him have a lot of conversations about that. But, you know, I, I love talking to him because he's just one of these young kids that he, he's got a lot of knowledge and he's got a lot of lust and um, mm -hmm. passion for the game. And, he's going to um, be something be, special, man. He's going to be something special. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and the, the, the thing for me is I don't care if you got two followers and I don't care if nobody knows you. To me, it's if, if I find that I've, I've talked to you a few times and, and I feel like, man, you got a, you, you got a good soul and um, you're just a guy that has a lot of good character, then um, I want to, I want to, I want to hang out with you. And I don't care if you have money or don't have money or people know you're famous or whatever the case is. And so that was like the biggest thing for me is like building cold collective is really built around hanging out with people who are, I mean, you and I, we talk about this all the time, but just really people who are just like-minded in that sense. And it doesn't matter if you drive a damn Civic or a freaking CRV, you know, my thing is, and that's the reason why I still keep my old cards around because, you know, if, if someone's going to judge me, like if someone just met me and they're like, oh, who the fuck is this guy? He drives an old CRV. Like, he's, you know, he's nobody. Oh, cool. Like, then you missed an opportunity to get to know me and you don't know who I'm, what I'm about. And if that's the case, then, bro, like, you know, like, go live your life. But my thing is, like, I'm trying to build relationships with people that want to build relationships based on the character of, of who you are. And yes. so um, so that's the biggest thing for me. And it's hard sometimes because being in the Porsche world is you're, you're dealing with a lot of people who have egos. And you're dealing with people who want to be known. And also, I mean, you got to imagine building this page, people want to use sometimes they want to use me as a way to announce themselves or build clout or whatever the case is. And, and my thing is like, I'm very selective with who I may associate with because I don't yeah. want to be associated with people who are just going to just be loud mouths and just kind of run their, their clout. And so and my thing is once again, like I don't, I don't care if you own every single RS in, in the country and I don't care if you own every paint to sample 
like none of that none of that concerns me like i don't care if you own um a long hood that's rusted up i don't care if you own a 996 i don't care if you own a 997 i don't care if you own i don't even care if you own a damn car there's so many and, and you can attest to this but a lot of these guys that that i know i mean there's even jess um um jeff yesterday and um um i remember i met jeff and jackie at love to colts six last year they came i remember oh, uh, jackie came up to me she came up to me uh, at the end of the show and she was acting kind of weird and i don't know if she's watching right now but she is um uh, she was being super shy and i couldn't figure out if what, what the problem was and it's it's weird because she was she was kind of i mean i'm gonna use the term starstruck very lightly but she was she was kind of in awe that she was standing next to me and i was like what the hell that's that's so weird because you know she she was following me and she loved everything i was doing and I was trying to wheel her in because I wanted to talk to her because, I was like, you know, obviously she loves cars and she's a girl and stuff. So we ended up talking and we got very comfortable with her and her boyfriend, Jeff. And I've seen them. They, were, they came out to the race service event. And I love it because you know that she doesn't have a car, but you know that she's obsessed with Borges. And my thing is, like, if you, if you have love for something, man, I want to really help you. And, you know, when we did the race service thing, I, I, you know, we were going to do a um, – around the block thing with race servers. They want to take photos and stuff. And, you know, Jackie was standing there with Jeff and I was like, dude, you guys want to jump in, in, in one of the, in one of the cars. And of course, Jackie's face like lit up because she was like, and she's super shy. So if you ever meet her, like when you come here, if you ever meet her, she's just like, yes. And I was like, man, go jump in that car. Like I was like, whose car do you want? Jump in? You know, you want, Bless you want to jump in the Nardo, you know, like everybody loves Nardo or like Mike's car, whatever. I was like, dude, just tell me. And then I'll throw you in the car. And so to me, it's like, if you can put a smile on somebody's face that just feels like, I mean, who's going to want to talk to me? I don't own a Porsche. I'm a girl. Um, you know, I'm a product of something, someone who, like, if someone would see me in LA, would, they, wouldn't even, they wouldn't even talk to her. You know, she's young. You know, um, whatever reason, they, they, if they looked at her, they wouldn't really give her a time of day. And so to me, I love the fact that she still comes around and she always says, what's up to me? Like, I love to put, I love to see that smile. When you get to see somebody who's genuinely like, oh my God, like Drew, yes, thank you. You know, because, you know, it's, it's easy for me to go, hey, Aaron, can she jump in your car? And Aaron's going to be like, hell yeah. Versus if some random person came up to Aaron and said, can I go sit in your car? They're going to be, Aaron's going to be like, uh, dude, I don't know you, you know? And so uh, it's, to me, it's like, yeah. And so it, but, once again, it always comes down to, Man, just be a good person. Just put a, if you got love, I got love for you. And that's all that matters to me. So, um, like make and, effort. and like make yeah, make effort. effort. That's, that's really what it is. You know, also people, cause sometimes people, you know, I hate, I hate the guys that come up to me or just even on Instagram. Yo, can you follow me? Can you do this and that? And it's like, yo, I never go up to like any of my more famous friends and go, man, can you, um, can you get whatchamacallit follow me? This and that. I'm like, yo. I remember there was a time where like somebody was like, hey, uh, how come Magnus is not following you? You should go like do this with Magnus or this or that. And I was like, look, even though Magnus is pretty good friends with some of my good friends, I was like, yo, when that time comes, like it will come. It'll be organic. You know, and it'll be organic. That's all I care about. And I don't care that it's Magnus or this or that and, and that he's following me or whatever the case is or Porsche is following me. Like um, my thing is like, I just care if there's somebody real and authentic behind the scenes and that's all i've spent my time and those are the type of people that i hang out around with because you yeah. know if you're just out there trying to chase numbers and followers and stuff i mean if that's your life you know so be it but you know that's not that's not my focus so we your questions um there wasn't many questions last time but the great thing i liked about what i saw was that there was a lot of agreements from previous people everyone was talking about how uh, you know, they were agreeing with everything that we were saying. I think one of the questions we had was something to do with camber, um, you know, um, uh, negative camber, yes or no, I think was one of the questions. Hello again for everyone. Um, What's up, Raj? Yeah, see, uh, it was interesting because did you see Esteban came on literally just after you finished talking <laughs> about him? Creepy, um, isn't it? Creepy. Yeah, it was a little bit. It was almost like, oh, someone said my name. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I was 
I agree with you wholeheartedly. One of the reasons why Ren Eleven kind of at the time when I first heard you on Picar Talk, which was during Das Ren Treffen, this is multi layered because I did I did my first trip to America this year, as some of you know. Did Das Ren Treffen as well. Um <laughs> So glad you came out. Oh man, so I was so glad I came out. It it was it was great because I managed to meet so many great people that I've only had the opportunity to speak to online. But it was it was it was brilliant and it it you know we'll get to that element in a sec but you know last year I listened to the podcast with mike and aaron and you were on it and one of the things you said uh, and i remember it stuck and i remember nodding in my car driving when i was listening to it going that is completely right and it was about it's bringing people together it's bringing people of a of uh, the right mindset the same point of view and we all love cars which is a given this is what brings us together but i think i mentioned this to someone was it uh, i mentioned this to someone a couple of weeks ago but i said the cars bring people together but the people keep the people there yeah. and that for me was <clears throat> the pivotal part of made me thinking okay maybe this page which was at the point called that 911 page you know sorry the 911 page sue me um made me want to change it from just a faceless page to something like it resembles now and it's kind of getting out of hand and then fast forward a year and i'm stood there with you with aaron with mike with Esteban with with you know Rob from the nine six four page, uh, Rob. Brandon, you know um, with Brandon here, Brandon enthusiast who you've actually interviewed on a Life Unhyped as well. So uh, there's there's loads of parallels here, um, and and however many people, it was just like, you know, it was like a live version of Forza Horizon or, or Need for Speed, but with a lot more comedy and love, dare I say it. And if it wasn't for me taking that step to go, yeah, do you know what? I want to send a message to Drew saying, you're completely right. I get what you're saying. Because that's what I said to you. It was like, you know, I, I listened to you on the on the Picard Talk podcast and I agree with you 100%. Um, and, and that was that. And look at us like 14 months later. This is, this is, I am an example of what you just said. I'm an example of if you are sincere in your approach, if you use social media and use the social part of social media, you will go places. You will get places. You will meet people. The places are insignificant. The people I've met, I've made friends for life. You know, you, um, you know, Aaron, uh, you know, Mike, Esteban, um, you know, uh, even people like Jaime and uh, Al, you know, Sunil, I finally started speaking to them literally at the end when they found out I traveled to, me and Vix traveled all the way to America for the first time just to go to Das Ren the, the, the first point. They were like, wow, okay, really? And that was it. And then we brought people like Richard, Steel City Porsche over and his wife Wendy and his daughter Millie as well. And it was really, really good. We had everyone By the together. way, Millie... Millie is my uh, my adopted child now, Richard and um, <laughs> <laughs> Richard. Uh, Richard so graciously handed over Millie um, as my adopted daughter, so she's supposed to be coming to live with us. Well, supposed to have come live with us in the summer and be Kellen's new sister. So, um, so that was really funny <laughs> that conversation we had. But uh... <laughs> well, there you go. I think you could be. Oh, here we go. Here he is. Um, you know, you could be in with a chance of that, depending what uh, Richard says. You know, she is 18 now, and I'm sure... Yeah, she's, she's self-sufficient and independent. So, like, I have a daughter exactly. who's already just grown, and just, you know, she's amazing. You know, she's done well in school, and she's, she works, and it's... I love her, you know? She's, she's the best. I hear you. I hear you. And uh, <laughs> ASG Miami, which I think is Esteban, actually, he, he mentioned something which was which is beautiful. Let's go back up here. DRT with you guys was the coolest experience I've ever had in the industry so far. I, 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 I second that. I mean, you've done this a lot more. You've, you've been, you're now ooh, two and a half years deep into Cool Collective. 
So, uh, and then the previous years involved in the car industry and photography industry, but this, this Dester and Treffel was, was pretty smashing. Yeah. I think, um, you know, for me, it's, um, what I love about everything that I've done to this point is just, you know, between the guys in Chicago, the guys in New York, New Jersey, Miami, LA, NorCal, people in Vancouver, Seattle. Mm -hmm. It's just, man, everybody's the same. Meaning like, they just got love. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember when I first went to Miami, I was like, man, I don't know what this is going to be like. I remember I went to go see Danny and Eddie at RMC. Um, and it's so yeah, weird because sometimes you, you get to meet, you get to meet people who are different online than, than they are in person. Um, but I got along with Danny really well because we just talk a lot of shit. Even when I met you, it's it's like right now we're being very friendly. But you know, there's a part <laughs> of us that that just you know we just like boys be boys, you know. And uh, yeah. Danny and Eddie, they're exactly like that, and uh, I love it's them tight, because we call them. Yeah, you know, it's <clears throat> it's just um, you know, it's just at the end of the day, you know, they they got great hearts. They're, they're great people. Um, I adore them dearly, and. Um, um, just in Miami in general, man, Miami is just filled with a lot of people who got a lot of passion, just not for cars, but just for just everything, you know? And nice. so, uh, I love Miami, man. I love the people in Miami. Um, but, but that's not to say like, you know, people like I need to, you know, I, most people don't know, but I was born in Texas, but I was only there for two months of my life. Um, I need to go back to Texas and, um, um, and really check out Dallas and Austin and be a part of uh, Houston. Houston's got a huge car community. And Houston. just go there and be a part of the South. You know, I've talked to guys like uh, like Andrew from 99 South and uh, Fu. Um, a lot of the guys out there um, uh, uh, and Porsche Passionist, you know, they're Anthony is like, they're all out there in, Jeff, in Georgia. Yeah. They, you know, and uh, Anthony, Jeff, and all the other guys that are out there. It's, it's you got all of that South who's you know obviously georgia is the you know the the hometown or headquarters for um for everything you know porsche but you know all of that has like a real huge thing and to be honest really what i want to do what i wanted to do sometime in the next couple of years was i wanted to get an rv and i wanted to basically trailer my 964 take this rv with my family and just tour the country and i really hope that to be honest yesterday oh actually I want to bring this up. Yesterday, I did that Zoom conference with a bunch of people. Um, Steve was on there. A bunch of people were on there. And we were talking about, like, Darren from FD was on there. And I was talking about doing... Um, FD most I wanted Darren to, Fister, just for yeah. people who aren't aware. There you go. I wanted to go to... Um, you know, I was looking at the map because I was talking about maybe meeting halfway between Chicago and, and SoCal. And I was like, you know what, Denver? Because we're, we're talking about Denver. And I was like... Denver might be a good place for the Midwest people to meet up with the SoCal people. And, but not only that, go to Denver and then drive up to like Montana. Cause I've always wanted to go to Montana and see the bison Rome and stuff and Buffalo and stuff. And I was like, what if we did and drove all through like Yellowstone, that would be freaking super epic. You know, whether we're camping or whatever, Andrew from, you know, Georgia, he was just like, dude, I'm in like, he was, he was ready to drive up and, <laughs> You know, and I was like, you know, and I know guys like Chris, Chris drives freaking everywhere. You know, I know Chris would be amazing, but just to take the people who we already know who love to drive and just put them, um, just gather people, everyone, you know, like Eric driver from Arizona and just have this thing maybe once a year where everyone just gathers. And if we anyone just has freaking... a spare 911 I could drive, I'm happily go down. <laughs> just saying. Anyone you know, know what? But. <laughs> You know what the crazy thing is? Like, I plan I plan on picking up a couple of cheaper like, um, like nine four fours and like nine fourteens and stuff. And what I would do is get into a car like that, and all of us just jump in and like once a year, like in the summer, we'll all go meet up in like in Yosemite, or wherever, or different parts of the country, and just fucking drive and tour and eat and drink and hang out and freaking just have a blast imagine keith like i love keith man like you know keith is like my jewish brother that won't move out to california we've always talked about this over and over again but you know like it's we have so many of us in our circle right now that i feel like we're we're i mean we're we're spread out all over the globe and yeah. 
it's just one of those things. It's like, why not start a convention? And it's not, it's not even just a Porsche thing. It's just a freaking people who just love to live life and just enjoy driving and eating and drinking and all of those things, you know, not at all the same it. time, but just to get together and say, Hey, look, man, we're just a unity of people who like, like to just do shit, you know? And yeah. that's really what it's about without getting all the corporate greed in there and saying, Hey, look, you need to pay us a thousand bucks to drive or, Whatever the case is, it's just, no, man, it's just us. Everyone's putting an effort. Everyone's putting an effort to get here, to drive here, to be a part of it, to help organize, and just be a part of a greater adventure. Yeah. And that's what really I'm aiming for in the next couple of years, um, if not this year or next year, to really gather and, and put that segment of everything together. Um, that's really where my – my heart and energy lies because once again it's you know building a community is not easy you know and you got once once it's built every at that point everybody wants to join but you're i mean i'm trying to find the people who are trying to be day ones right that have been there day one that have been there when i was a growing page or you're growing page or like just the fact they're like hey look i don't know who the fuck this guy is but yeah. i like him you know because i don't care that if he's got a car or don't got a car it's just i like to hang and so why not get a bunch of people who uh, want to, you know, take a week off and just go explore together. And this, you'd be, you'd be surprised how many people in this country haven't. Re- I mean, imagine even you in, in, in England, like have you explored like all parts of England and most people haven't explored their own countries. I've done, I've done, you know, length and breadth of England. Um, I've not done Scotland and, and hey, it's literally just further, a little bit further North. Um, I know that Raj who is watching has done Scotland he did it last year, and I think him and his friends are planning to do something in, in Ireland this year. Well, we're planning uh, until what's going on. So, um, But, you know, there's so much that I still haven't done. You know, I'd love to do Scotland. I did Wales last year with the 9-6, and that was, that was insane. I've done Europe. I've driven through France to go to. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Worth a C? Uh, Worth I am, but I'm... Yeah. It, 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 it's kind of like that without... I want to say without the, all the young, right? Because all the young kids, they, you know, they're, you know, they do crazy things, right? And then also you got the, the guys with, who have tons of money um, who also do kind of reckless things, right? Because, you know, they have money, they don't care. And I want to kind of be in the middle of that, right? Like mm. have some cool cars, but we're not young and reckless. You know, we just want to just have good memories, you know, good, just a good time together. And so... Um, that's kind of where I'm trying to hit that point on, right? And, of course, I can see over the years more and more people would probably be want to be a part of that. But the only thing is once you build up something, usually saturation has a way of killing something because, you know, the people who aren't part of it don't know the core purpose of something. They want to come in. They'll fuck shit up and ruin it because they're like, oh, I didn't know that you guys are not freaking trying to do burnouts and do, you know, 200-mile-per-hour runs and all of those things. And it's like, dude, you know, once again, we love cars, but at the same time, you know, we're all in our, you know, pushing towards our 30s and 40s and, you know, whatever the case is. I'm not trying to kill myself, you know, no. and so the experiences it's just one of those things. last longer like that. The experiences with people like minded doing cool shit with cars. That's what's going to stick in your head, you know, 30 years from now when we're kind of, well, hopefully I won't be, but you never know, pissing your own pants and stuff and, and, and remembering what it was like to have teeth. Um, How do you so, do that? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? That's already happening in your forties, bro. Oh Jesus Christ! I've got two years left uh, before I start needing uh, rubber pants. Thank you. Um, I, I suppose you know. This Steve is, says fifty. Kind of, what it's this is what it's all about, though, isn't it? It, it is all about the. Uh, and, and by the way, if anyone is in their fifties, sorry, Raj, or, or anyone like that, or in their seventies, we we don't need to, mean to knock you. It's not your fault oh. that you were born. <laughs> too early um <laughs> but, you know what can we say i think i think we've covered quite a lot of ground uh and i'm i'm, I'm it's quite a humbling experience being able to i know we've we we're, we're, we're friends we're mates and i know i make fun of you rotten and you do the same to me and <laughs> that's how you know that's how you know i love you if i text if i if i can talk shit about you then you made it into the circle 
Uh, yeah, exactly. And and I, and I feel that it's it's like the old old saying: the, the person you like the most, the person you're punching in the arm in the playground and running away. Uh, and I feel like we got that. Hence why I stole your phone, and I'm still yet to see all the footage properly played. I've just seen pictures and stills, but. Uh, you know, I, uh, I went hell for leather for that, you know. Um, and for people that don't know, uh, during day four of Das Rentreffen, um, Mike, uh, <laughs> I'm going to pin him on this because he kind of, it was him actually. Um, he gave me your phone and he said, oh, we've got to give it back to him. I was like, I ain't giving it back to him. Uh, not until I actually steal some, <laughs> take, some uh, take some videos. So I literally ran, and uh, I use that word again, literally, and I've noticed I use literally. And literally. Thank you very much, literally. Uh, and I ran around as far as I could to speak to so many people. Um, New Jer Is it Jerry from New Jersey 911? Um, I spoke to him, Richard, and got them to say hello. I spoke to... God, I, I forget who I spoke to. I just spoke to as many people as I could grab. I was trying you, to get the thought, guys. Imagine if you operated at that level all the time. <laughs> you put in a lot of work in a short amount of time. I, I would have had a heart attack, my friend. I was sweating <laughs> buckets. It was hot. You know, it, just because <laughs> it was, it was early February didn't mean jack shit. The place was hot. I was, I was, I never I was want to be, in, I never want to be in Miami in the summer ever because no. last year, the previous year in 2018, it was freaking hot and i was like dude it's winter time what the hell no uh, no definitely not i'm not, not doing that but but you i don't know, know how you, any of you guys in florida do it but uh they're just they're, they're made for it you know esteban you know he's probably just like yeah this is what what 40 degrees sorry 110 degrees out here that is a very cool day you know they love brandon bites. brandon how hot is it in miami right now i gotta yeah. know uh, not in Miami, but he's actually a little bit more north, I think. Mm. Um, but Florida is just hot as hell, man. It is too hot. It's too hot. Um, okay, yeah. so questions-wise, um, there yeah. hasn't been many questions, but there was a couple. If anyone's got any questions they want to ask uh, Drew now, um, uh, it's humid. Oh, okay, so it must be a little bit tepid compared to most. Oh, and rainy, yeah. Uh, any questions you want to ask Drew? Now's the opportunity to do it. Um, so write them down, and I will um, I'll ask them. But one of the questions was negative camber, uh, yay or nay? Um, yeah. I mean, I feel like you should always have some level of negative camber. Um, not, you know, negative five, six. I mean, here's a funny story. When I bought my M3, um. The, the the seller who was an older guy who was a very classy guy had bbs's on them in order to make them fit he ran a very aggressive negative camber it wasn't until i got to the alignment shop that i realized that i was running negative seven and that my friend is a terrible idea <laughs> you should probably be you should probably be between two and negative three and a half is, you know, for the most part, depending on, you know, your suspension specs and stuff. But, you know, yeah, you should be running. Never run positive ever, ever. If you run positive camera, I'm not trying to talk to you. That's not. Negative seven. Hold on a second. Where you? No, yeah, like, no, it was bad. It to 2015 with a DeLorean or something. What the, what the, what the hell, man? Trust me. The, the car drove so terribly. And when I finally went to go really? get the car um, <laughs> tested, the guy, yeah, imagine, right? <laughs> Oh my God. I was just like, who the hell does this? But of course, Stance Nation and all those Stance guys, which Hammer gang. Fine, you know, like live your life, you know, but <clears throat> I'm the guy, like, like I said before the other night, like I want my cars to look good, but also want them to function. You know what I'm yes. saying? Like, I'm not like these guys. It's it, the guys that really irritate me are like these ultra purists. And they're like, why would you touch anything that Porsche has done is perfection. And it's like, it's not perfection. I've already uh -huh. talked to, I've uh, said that many times again, but I've, I've talked to the damn 964 designer and even he said what he said, which I haven't released a video yet, but even he agrees with me. And it's like, you know, their manufacturers are bound by certain laws and regulations that mm. already tells you that they can't build a perfect car because they have to build it within spec. And Correct. so, um, so the biggest thing, for me ab above all else is that when you're walking around saying oh my god like oh is perfect and you can't top that man you're also talking about 30 years of difference in technology like there's a huge difference mm. you know and so um so yeah so be progressive like just because you're you're modding your car 
that doesn't go, mean to go out and put shitty ass parts on there. Like, look for quality parts. Mm. But you can still modify your car and be more progressive and still do it in a proper way. And that's the biggest thing. Just be proper. Do it proper. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. Have a have a clear goal in mind when you when you're building your car i've always thought that you know if you go for a route and plan everything meticulously you'll never end up in, in doing something bad but make sure you do it because you want it that way i've seen so many people build cars for other people and it's the, yeah. the wrong thing to do and i mean camber's one of those things but brandon he's running minus five so he is off the, uh, <laughs> brandon, living life on the uh, edge, edge of the tire you know what but you know, drift drifters and you know stance guys run things purposely a little differently. Yeah. So you know, and I know he runs a couple of different Nissans and stuff. So it's not that I always say like build with purpose. You know, and mm. if if there's a reason why you need to run that much, then you know, all good. So, yeah. um, Michael uh, just here said, "What is the latest thing you bought for your Porsche?" <clears throat> um. So when I got my car, there was a lot of things really sloppy with it, shifter being one of them. Uh, when I got my golden rod and shifter from FD, I mean, imagine driving five months with a sloppy shifter. I mean, I couldn't even find first gear. It was super Staring sloppy. Staring porch? It was bad. Even when I was in first gear, it was still like spinning around, you know? Um, <laughs> it, was, it was bad. It was super bad. <clears throat> and I never let anybody drive the car because like I knew that they would have problems getting into first and third gear. Um, that single handedly was like the biggest thing for me, but I have a huge lineup of modifications coming for the car. Like the car will be set up absolutely to my perfection. Um, uh, and that's just the biggest thing for me. The car will look great and it will handle great. And, um, that's, that's my main purpose. So. Okay, cool. Um, a couple of comments here, I think less rather than questions, comments, I think whilst we were talking about that trip and I mentioned it would be great to have a car uh, to drive in, I think Keith, what the fook, um, has stated that he has an 88 cab for me that I can drive. So that I'm assuming he wants me to come and stay with him at the start. So, yeah, I'm in. Done. Yeah, he um, he loves men. You know what I'm saying? So, um... <laughs> mate, some of the messages bring... I've got from you, you love men. So, mm. oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, no <laughs> doubt. I, I never try to hide that. No, no, a I lot of clue, uh, You know what? My wife knows, like, I don't, I don't have girlfriends. I have a lot of boyfriends. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, Eric just asked 964 RS or 997 yes. GT3 RS pumpkin. Woo! Woo! So, here's the thing. I've never driven a 964 RS, but I know a couple of people who've owned them back in England. Mm -hmm. And funny thing is, <clears throat> there's a guy named Stuart who used to work for Lotus. And I met him at one of the uh, 70th anniversary. Um, he has a 996 GT3 and a 92 964C2. And he said back in England, he used to own a couple of RSs or 964 RSs. And he said he drove them around for a few years. And he said that he didn't even really like them much because he said they drove kind of terribly. And But he used to own them when they were like 25, 30 pounds, right? 30,000 mm. uh, 30, pounds. And he goes, it wasn't, yeah. he goes, it was never really a big deal. He goes, I don't know what the big deal is. And he sold them. And he goes, now, of course, prices went fucking kahuni, right? And they went crazy. <clears throat> but here's the thing that I wanted to state that I didn't state earlier was, unless I have a bunch of fuck you money, I am not looking to own a bunch of one of one, one of five super rare cars that one I can't modify, I can't drive. Um, they're trophy cars. I'm really against trophy culture because if you have like one of five cars, then the whole the whole idea of like drive culture really goes out the window. Yeah, and it's not. It would be nice to have like an RS, like even a <clears throat> a nine six four RS. Like in Maritime, because that's kind of the most iconic one. But to be honest, well, the Maritime, you know, you could probably throw some springs on there, lower it a little bit, but just keep it the way it is and drive it, you'll be okay. But for the most part, if you're driving around a car that you're afraid you're going to put some chips on it or, you know, get some scratches or some mileage and stuff, I'm not really interested in that whole culture. So if it was up to me, if I had a car, let's say if I had a 964 RS right now and it's worth $300,000, I would definitely sell it and I would go out and buy like 
a regular narrow body C2, C4, buy a couple of those, buy a 993. And I'll just buy a couple of nor more normal baseline cars and just make them mine. Because yes. I'm really more about tuning cars than I am about having special edition cars. And then I'd rather have more cars that I can have when friends come over and drive them with me. Um, one of my other purposes for, you know, when I was supposed to get into my own warehouse space in, in March, and that didn't happen because there was a, a delay, a postponement. But what's going to happen is I'm going to build, I mean, I said this last time when I was talking to Mark, but I'm going to build at least five low budget, like either Miatas, Civics, hatchbacks, um, older cars where they freaking haul ass, but I could build them for under 10K. I'm, I want to build about three or five of them. So when I have friends that do come over and you're like, Drew, uh, can we go for a drive? And can I take out your K series EK? I'm like, yes. And yes, because my thing is like, I want to go and have a variety in my garage without saying, Oh, here's a 964 and that cost me 50 K. And I can only have one of those when I can have five badass cars that I can beat on. And if the mm -hmm. engine blows, no problem. I'll just go out and buy another engine. Right? Exactly. And so, <clears throat> so that's the biggest thing for me is to live a culture that really exemplifies drive culture. Everyone, do you, do you feel like, I'm going to stem, stem on from that question. Do you feel like the Carreras get knocked on an awful lot then because they're not a GT3? Because I, I, was I was in the market and I <clears throat> could have bought a 996 GT3. I would not be taking it to the track and therefore would not be utilizing it in its proper <laughs> in its proper way that's why i went with a, a c2 because it was a, a as pure experience dare i say it for, for me you know sense. i do want to reference you know going back to eric's question because i didn't really answer it um i don't i don't know if i have an answer the reason why i don't mind buying like a 997 rs um which is something i'm gunning for um even though I'm, that totally contradicts what i just said previously but the thing is um water cooled RSs. <laughs> well, the thing is, water cooled RSs. I feel like are not. I mean, because they made so many of them, it's. I don't feel like they're anything that special. You know what I'm mm. saying? Like, I really, I really struggled with. Like, I mean, I would love to have a pumpkin RS, and of course, if they come down to ninety grand, I'll probably pick one up. But the the thing is, I have an issue with, um, like for example, when I bought my ninety seven GT three, the Delta between an RS and a non-RS, if it's like maybe 15 or 20%, I feel like an RS, like I said, 997.1 RS, it is so, the upgrades are so minuscule. The reason why I really like the RS is just because of the color schemes, because of the pumpkin or the frog, <laughs> even the snowman, which I, I nicknamed the snowman. But um, for me, those three color schemes, like I like a lot in, in, in the wider rear ass. But yeah. for me, the upgrade in price, the premium in price wasn't worth the, the value that I got. So to me, I'd rather just have, uh, I always ask, my, ask myself the question, would I have a 997.1 RS or would I rather have a regular GT3 and have a 964 for the same price? And my answer always came back, I would rather have a 964 and a GT3. Yeah. And so... For me, every time I tried justifying R an RS, it just never made sense. And so that's the reason why I don't own one, but I would love to have one. But also we know that an RS 964 is more special than a 997 RS is. And mm -hmm. so I feel like it's kind of hard to compare those two, but if I had it my way, I mean, a 964 RS would be an easy answer, but because the price delta is so huge, Realistically, I would say Pumpkin RS would be a car that I would own in the near future. Okay, so yeah. there you go. To answer Eric's question, there, there's your answer. We had a really good question from, uh, yeah, it was completely loaded as well from, uh, from a friend of ours, Raj. So, so guys, controversial question. What do you think of cars running air ride suspension? Um, okay, I'll, I'll let you go first. Um, I mean, air ride has become such a long way and there's different ways to run air. Now you can run full air or you can run cups. Um, I'm not a fan of air suspension for many reasons. Um, not that I have a problem with them, but just due to reliability, um, be between bags popping based on, um, friction or, um, them, the rubber getting old or whatever the case is also, 
I mean, as good as Air has become, I still feel like it's still short of a good coilover suspension. And so for me, um, if your lifestyle revolves around stancing and not really driving a car aggressively, then by all means. But for me, like I have bags on my wagon and I don't mind it until I got stuck on the side of the freeway at three in the morning and it was so dumped that I couldn't even get on the damn truck. To me, stuff like that, reliability is like a real big thing for me. It's like really high on the list. And because of that, air suspension, there's just way more things that can go wrong. And I know a lot of people can argue like you can make air suspension more reliable, but at the end of the day, it will never still be as reliable as a coilover system ever because you're talking about you're talking about physical shock and spring, right? I mean, there's less parts to go wrong versus having eight valves and like, you know, bags and hoses. And there's just so many things that can just go wrong. And sensors now, sensors you know, regulating and, things. Yeah, Almost all that like stuff. Almost OEM level kind of, kind right. of systems. Don't and, know. and of course, having a, a, a cup system would be a nice compromise. But you know what? I, I'm used to driving super low cars and look, I'm, I'm okay without cups, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm okay driving static and dumped. And that's just, that's just my lifestyle. And then, but you know, that's, that, that's how I would answer that question. So. Oh, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at this because it, it, yeah. it, back in the day, you know, and I still think it's current, you know, you've got people who are into bagging cars and you've got people who are into the static life. And, and I was fortunate to uh, spend time with people who, you know, ran ultra low suspension with H and R's or, or, you know, um, KW based suspension systems. Um, and it's, you know, crazy how low they can actually run their cars, depending on, on you know, um, what application you can get like a 140 mil drop. Uh, 150 mil drop uh, on a particular car and you think 150 mil it's crazy when you consider yeah uh, it's a huge uh, huge change then there was just doing hey, Andy uh, I just want to say what's up to Andy in Melbourne oh good wow morning, good morning Andy good to see you mate you know um, he's a legend that guy um, the there was this dude on Instagram I think he's still there I think his name is sideways and smiling and he runs a Subaru Impreza Time Attack car, uh, the, like, the, the, the entry level, I, I don't want to say entry level class because I, I don't want that to diminish. I think it's something to do with it's, it's road worthy. So you can actually drive it on the road as, and, uh, as well as track it. And he runs an airlift suspension setup and he has demolished the opposition. I mean, I haven't paid much attention in the last couple of years, but Indeed, 2016, 2017, 2018, he was unstoppable. And everyone else was running standard coilovers. And he was in a, a car with Airlift 3H, 3P? I'm, I'm not too sure. Uh, my knowledge isn't strong. Um, I see Raj Sanger. Uh, he will change your thought process. There's, there's <laughs> people within Speed Hunters um, who run Airlift on their cars. And they run it with... Without a tire stretch, they run a chubby tire setup, um, and the cars look really, really good. They're, they're great for photography, and then they can use them. Yes, I agree. I've heard some really bad uh, stories about people being left in a lurch, like yourself, um, because you know things just go wrong, and, and nothing is one hundred percent apart from VTEC engines, I suppose. Um, <laughs> not going to go wrong, uh, but but you know. Um, it, for, for for me, I probably will always go with coilover suspension. However, you know, I can be changed depending on the application. But I won't be putting it on the 996. I'm sorry, Rush. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's me. Um, there was... Uh, I'll go through two more questions, folks, because um, we really are running out of time. Uh, but ASG Miami, uh, you've been everywhere. What city has had the craziest builds? Well, you know, Miami is lucky because you guys don't have any laws pertaining to emission, you know, like. <laughs> I just saw Raj's reply, sorry. <laughs> and I would say, um, um, you know, the thing is, um, you know, for example, like, you know, Mike's 964. I mean, dude, talk about just absurd, right? You're talking about that car as loud as hell. But, you know, um, 
you know, even with California, even with all of the restrictions here, we have a lot of crazy ass cars here, you know? And so, um, I would say between California and Miami would probably be a pretty good, uh, pretty good answer. So, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, Miami is just they're crazy. They they run cars without fenders, without bonnets. I'm surprised they actually run cars with seats. Um, so that's good. And one last question. Now there was two questions on this, so I can actually use use both. What are your thoughts on the four cylinder transaxle models, like the nine two four, nine four four, nine six eight? And someone also said, what are your thoughts on the nine six eight? So we are combining those two questions. Boom, go. Um, I'm actually actively looking for all three of those right now. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm actually looking at um, either 951s or uh, 968s. Um, and I, you know, I think they're great looking cars. I just think that finding one in really good condition that doesn't cost an arm and a leg is going to be my biggest challenge. Um, but I'm actively looking. So mm -hmm. I think they're great. And that says enough. Uh, and my first foray into Porsche ownership within the family was a 924 that my dad had uh, a, uh, a Y plate one in a, in a gold champagne gold color with a beige cloth interior. It was so period. It looked cool, man. But my dad would never, ever, ever let me drive it. And uh, I asked him a few years later, like, why didn't you ever let me drive it? And his exact answer was, I don't know. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Dad. So, Appreciate you know, it. everyone's making some comments about 968. Um, I'm a real big fan of 968s. Um, my buddy just picked one up. Um, they look great. And what I want to do is I want to get one and really mod one because I think they will look great modded. And I haven't really seen any modded really well. Um, and so that's kind of my hope and i'm hoping to get into a yellow one because i really want a yellow car um and so that's kind of where my direction is oh yellow would be nice so, uh, i'm uh, i'd like a red 968 to be fair but then i like to have everything red in my life so <laughs> i used to be like that at one point in my life everything was red yeah. but um yeah okay um folks thank you very much for your questions we are on to the last part of this uh endeavor uh which is the interview um and i do actually have a task for you we have two minutes we have 15 questions you have to answer as many questions, questions as you can and this is the point you have to answer as many questions as you can within those two minutes okay the first time we did this with eric um we ended up spending a good 25 30 minutes answering his questions because eric's an in-depth <laughs> in-depth guy and i keep on going back to it, so still on there mate uh you are the the first yardstick then last week uh i did it with uh lorena um and we only did it over a minute and it was just not enough so we've increased it to two minutes so so you want me to you want me to answer but not give explanations no no explanations just answer first thing that comes into your head you'll like these okay. questions brother okay okay <clears throat> okay okay so okay. the timer starts now Best Porsche ever. 964. <laughs> Dog or cat? Dog. What would you drive if Porsche never made a car? It's easy. NSX. <laughs> of course, no. <don't. laughs> Last song you listened to in your car? Uh, Mac Miller. Um, good news. Uh, best Porsche color? Uh, Signal yellow. Okay. Highway or canyon? Canyon. Cool. Porsche they never should have made. Nine six eight. <laughs> no, I was going to nine six four, <laughs> but <laughs> I was thinking of nine six eight because you know it's on my mind. But I was going to say nine six four just to Good. troll. <laughs> Schumacher or Senna? Senna. Okay. How could they improve the current 911? <sighs> Man, shrink it in size. Okay. That's my only answer. Shrink it in the wash. Favorite drink? Uh, Orange Bang. I'll introduce you once you come here. Safe, man. Uh, favorite modified Porsche other than your own? Um... Um, Aaron's? I, I love Aaron's car. Okay. 
Um, there's a beautiful car. Uh, Chinese food or Italian food? Chinese food. And uh, favourite film with a Porsche in it? A favourite what? Like favourite film with a Porsche in it. You've got 10 seconds. What's a film? Film. Film. Uh, cinema. Oh, oh um, babe, favourite film, huh? Favourite film with a Porsche in it? Yeah. And that's <laughs> it. You're out of time, mate. You're out of time. That one's, t- that one's tough on the spot. Um, I have asked, and I'll let you finish. Huh? My wife says 16 candles. <laughs> no, okay. uh, 16 you candles. know what? Um, I would say Bad Boys 1. I saw Bad Boys 3, and I have to say it's a pretty terrible movie. I like Bad Boys 3. I thought it was on, on par with the first one, better than the second. What? Yeah. Damn right. God, it was so bad. So oh, was my bad God. Boys. So was no, bad no, no, no. Like, I mean, maybe, but part three, it was so bad. I mean, it's... <laughs> I also do want to say, when I answered the um, the best car that Porsche's ever made, I said 964. Um, I do want to state that, of course, Porsche has made some amazing cars, amazing sports cars and race cars. But I just want to say of the cars that I've driven, um, because I can only talk about the experience of ownership. And so when I say that, the cars I do want to own, it it comes with an asterisk, which is um, cars that I want to own. So, of course, you know, you can say 917s and, you know, freaking 918s and every other freaking crazy car that's out there. But I've never driven them, so I can't say I would want to own them because maybe they're a terrible driving experience. I do not know. So, Cool. Uh, Good. Yeah. Well, you've survived that uh, and trolled your way to that question of <laughs> what Porsche they never should have made. Pussy. <laughs> So, uh, well, yeah, hold on. Right. And also, I do want to state that I guess the reason my my connection with that question is because when I finally released my interview with uh, Ben with Benjamin Dimson, the the lead designer, oh, um, yes. the nine six four um, shouldn't have been designed and been released the way it currently looks. So a lot of people will be in for a huge surprise when I do drop that video. But that is pertaining to that because as much as I love it they had a completely different vision for what the 964 should have looked like. And it's not that. So that's pretty crazy. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about that video to be fair. I've been waiting to see that and have that drop in your channel. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. I didn't expect it to be an hour and 40, but to be fair, it's worth it because there's always good information that comes out of your mouth, my friend. Um, thank you so oh, much. Oh, wow, baby. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, man, thanks for having me. You know, anytime, brother, anytime. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, that's it, really. Um, I think we're done. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to say? Any shout outs or anything? Um, no, man, I just, uh, I guess I just want to say, um, you know, for all of you guys out there, whether you guys are on the, uh, enthusiast side, on the, the fan side, on the content creating side, uh, whatever side you're on, make sure you guys put, uh, all your heart into it and make sure you guys be as authentic as possible. Even if that means you're being a big dork about it. Um, I'd rather hang out with a big dork than hang out with a cool guy who's fake as fuck. Um, and so, um, you know, at the end of the day, just just be you, man. And uh, hopefully that's enough to uh, allow people to see truly how great that is. And, um, you know, that's all I want to be surrounded by. And I hope that um, you guys will continue to do great things. So I really appreciate that. And uh, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Just if you're going to do something, do it right. Do it with gusto uh, and be you, the most important thing. And, and believe me, people will flock around those genuine folks, you know, um I've, I've realized that so i really appreciate it um thank you so much man i've got a little message to say um about the next uh guest that we've got coming on uh on wednesday so uh i'll uh, let you go so you can do your own thing my friend but much love all right guys take care take care man um so thank you very much again to drew and um, for that uh thank you so much for your time today folks really appreciate it uh i am going to be back on on wednesday uh so you'll see this uh, this mug uh, on your screens and at an earlier time of 6 p.m uk time um so that will probably be uh around about 1 p.m eastern time and uh 10 a.m 
uh, Pacific Standard Time. And I'm going to be joined by Frank Cassidy, uh, as in Black Betty and Co., also co-owner of Boxing Gasser, uh, which is a very well-known area all to do with Porsche. So he's going to be showing us around his sites uh, and showing us around his cars in more depth so you get to know him a little bit more than you may know him now. He's an absolute legend uh, and has an incredible taste in Porsches. So please tune in. Um, on those times, adverts will be going up tomorrow, so make sure you save the date. I don't know if you've got anything else better to do during these uh, interesting times, but please stay safe, look after each other, and thank you again for your unrivaled support. I really appreciate this. This interview is going to be going out uh, next, not this Thursday, but the Thursday after on YouTube. So please ensure that you're following me and subscribing to me on YouTube as well. Um, the YouTube link is on my bio at the front of the page. Much love to you all. Thank you so much for everything that you guys do. And uh, until next time, you take care of yourselves. Ciao, ciao.